Hi, and welcome to the Northern Illawarra United Church Sermon for this week, January 22nd. We're starting a new series that looks at our core vision as a church, that we're people who are centred on God, uh, open to all, amazed by grace, and here to help. And just over the next four weeks, I just want to spend a little bit of time unpacking each element of, those, of that vision, the four pillars, the four foundations of what it means to be our church. So today I want to talk about this concept of what it means to be centred on God. And by being centred on God, what I, I think we're trying to get across is that our community seeks to know the presence and power of God guided by the purposes and priorities of God. We want to be a church that sees God not as a means to an end, but as an end in himself, that God is the one who calls us together. God is the one on whom we are built, and God is the reason that we gather. Now, of course, we do a lot of things as a church. I mean, it feels like we're pretty busy. We build community. We support each other. We help our broader community in all sorts of ways. But when we begin, what we begin with and end with is God, the one who is before all things, the one through whom all things came into existence and who is at the end of all things. Now, that feels fairly high and mighty, I think. We're just regular people, so what do we have to do with God? And it's true, dealing with God is a serious business. But even in a humble, small church like ours, you and me, humble people, Dealing with God is serious business because we are made in the image of God. We are made for a relationship with God. And in fact, I would say that our souls, our sense of selves is not, are not fulfilled until we deal with God. St. Augustine, one of the ancient fathers of the church, said that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. We live in a world that doesn't have much time for God. I don't say that as a particular criticism. It's just the reality. It's a world full of distraction and misinformation. And it's so easy for us to find ourselves not centered on God and centered on almost anything else. Now, in our world today, there is a lot of talk about spirituality. And I'm kind of a fan. I mean, we ought to talk about our spirituality. But in some ways, we need to understand what that actually means because all of us are spiritual. Uh, we may as well say that we're biological. We're, we're, we're people who have spirit. So I think when people talk about spirituality, uh, what they mean is that they want a center, a sense of purpose and energy to guide in life, power to live with conviction and confidence, peace in the midst of trouble. In that sense, and I think that is the sense in which a lot of people mean by spirituality, it's a resource, an energy, a tool, a way of being that helps them in life. It's, a, it's wonderful, right? But it remains centered on me and my agenda. Now, I, I, spirituality, I, I'm all for it because anything, especially in our materialistic world, that feeds our soul is uh, all for it. But it can feel like water in a dry land. But at the end of the day, the center hasn't shifted. Even if we're talking spiritual things, if it's still about me, the center is still the self, the self's priorities and purposes. So spirituality and being centered on God are not quite the same thing. And I also want to say that religion and being centered on God are not quite the same thing. Religion, I think, can be defined as a set of rules and dogmas and institutions that if you follow them, if you join them, you get approval from God. And I think the reason this happens is that religion provides two very powerful things, a certainty and a sense of self-righteousness. It's not exactly peaceful, but it can be very useful, powerful in our world to find those two things. But the same problem remains. The religion that is about me uh, following the rules to get uh, uh, salvation, to get certainty, is still putting myself at the center. So spirituality and religion are not the same thing as being centered on God. And the fact of the matter is that uh, many people just avoid spirituality and religion altogether, I think especially in our culture. But we will find something that becomes our center, whether it's addiction, gambling, people pleasing, self-indulgence, money. We're driven to center our lives on something. The question is, if it's not God, then what is it? All these postures are centered on something other than God. And the Bible has uh, an interesting word for this. The Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition, has an interesting word for this. And it sounds kind of harsh, but I think it's actually an important word. When we center our 
lives on something other than God, we are falling into idolatry. Idolatry is simply putting something other than God. It might be a good thing, but something other than God at the center of our lives. It's either either ourselves and our interests or, or something or somebody else. And this is a radically different way of being in the world. We are either centered on God or we are idolaters. Let me give you an example. If I get up early in the morning and go and watch a sunrise, the spiritualist will say, what a lovely experience to see this sunrise. It moves me. It stirs my soul. It's given me peace and inspiration to go about my business. The sunrise exists to give me purpose to go out into the world. The religionist, the person who is obsessed with religion, has a hard time knowing what to do with the sunrise because it doesn't fit into rules or dogmas or institutions. So they tend to be a little bit more dismissive and uninterested in things that just stir emotion. The spirit remains unnourished. Perhaps they feel good about getting up early and being disciplined in that way. But again, the sunrise is valuable or not valuable based on what it does for me or doesn't do. But to be centered on God, to see something like a sunrise, is to be moved to thanksgiving and worship because the sunrise is in itself a gift from God. Not useful to me. It is simply a thing of beauty, an occasion for thanksgiving, an invitation to know God. Let's think of another example, not the sunrise, but maybe helping people. We feel like it's a good thing to help people. And I think for those people who are still centered on themselves, the idea of helping people happens as long as it feels good or, or feels rewarding. The person who is involved in religion helps people if they're deserving, if they become a Christian, if they uh, turn from their ways, if they earn what is given to them. But I think for the person who's centered on God, they serve and love other people because other people are made in the image of God. We serve and love other people not because we'll get something from them or we'll get them to do something or we'll fix them, but because they are in and of themselves, the imago Dei, the image of God. And that's why we help. Jesus says as much when he says, when you give a glass of water to somebody in my name, you do it for me. We love others because they are in the image of God, every single human being, worthy and unworthy. You see, in both these circumstances, God is not a means to an end. God is the very end, the goal for which we live and work. And as I said before, everything else is idolatry. The religious version, the spiritual version, and all the other versions, whatever we put at the center, if it's not God. So to be centered on God is to... Uh, seek and know the presence and the power of God guarded by the purposes and priorities of God. This is why the central work of the church is worship and prayer. The church does many useful things. I, I hope we are useful to the world. We love other people. We care for other people. We are hospitable. We build community. But at the end of the day, the central work of the church, the, the work that in, in a sense no one else does is that we put God at the center. We worship because God is the one at the center. Worship can create wonderful feelings that inspire and send us out into the world, but that is not primarily what it's for. Worship brings God's approval, but we don't do it in order to get approval. No, worship and prayer are simply done because God is the one who is at the center. From the world's point of view, from a useful point of view, they are in many ways a waste of time. But prayer and worship, in the truest sense, gather us before the very presence of God and name the truth that is invisible in so many other places that God is at the center. The early church wrestled with this question a lot. They were bringing together Jews and Greeks, people from all different walks of life who saw God as a means to many different ends, their own visions of what God was about. And so the early church uh, in the name of Jesus, was trying to figure out how to bring people together around God. And one of the early leaders of the church, Paul, uh, in his letter to the Ephesians, put into words what he meant by putting God at the center. He shares what he prays for the church, that basically they would have a vision for who God is. And so I want to read this passage for us. This is from Ephesians chapter 1, 
starting in verse 17 through verse 23. Let me read it for us. I pray that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your hearts enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the, heaven, from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So today I just want to talk uh, three brief things that Paul mentions here about putting God at the center. The first he says this, and I'll put it up on the screen. He says, he prays that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints. Paul says he hopes that we'll have the eyes, he prays that we'll have the eyes to see that there are soul riches, that there is joy, that there is hope that is available from God for us. This is our inheritance, the gift that we receive. And this is so important for us to understand because uh, if we think about God being a means to an end, that we use God to get something, we have already decided what it is that we think will most satisfy us. Either with God or without God, we think that this thing, money, relationships, will somehow satisfy the deepest longings of our soul. But what the one who puts their hope in God does is they step back and say, God, I'm not even sure I know what it is that will most satisfy me. So I place my hope in what God himself will provide, that God knows the desires of our hearts more than we do. This is so different from what most uh, many people think religion is some kind of trade-off or a deal where we say, okay, God, I'll give you this, so much time, so much money, so much worship, and then in return, you'll give me this, this, and this. But no, the, the Christian, the person who puts their soul in God's hands simply says, God, I trust you. You will satisfy my soul with good things. This is always a struggle. None of us do it perfectly but you'll notice that when we struggle, when we're in a time of difficulty or depression or discouragement, we will look immediately for comfort and control. Whether it's money or a tub of ice cream or, or drugs or alcohol or pornography or whatever it is, these things in a sense become the idols. They provide us with a sense of comfort and control. We know it's beneath us, but, but we pursue these things because they give us the feeling of comfort and control. The person who puts God at the center, the church that puts God at the center, gives up the illusion of control and trusts that God will meet our needs better than we could imagine them for ourselves. Our comfort comes from our hope that God knows better than we do. And this is why in Scripture we see this so often in the Psalms or in Jesus' teaching. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Don't put your hope in things that you can grasp and hold on to. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if our treasure is in what God will provide, then our heart will move towards God. The Psalm, Psalm 107 says, he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. And Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness but they will be filled. Friends, God will satisfy us. What no eye has seen or ear has heard or the heart has conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. Do we trust that God will not just provide us with what we ask for, but beyond anything we could ask or even imagine? So that's the first thing that Paul prays for, is that we'd see that our hope is in what God will satisfy us with. The second thing that Paul prays for is he says this. He says, God put this power, the power that we see in God's work, to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead. 
So Paul prays that we would see that God's power is a different kind of power. Now, this is so important to understand because for many people, religion and spirituality are closely associated with power. Power over ourselves or power over other people or or power in the political realm, getting things done. We evaluate whether trusting in God, worshiping God, following God, talking about God is useful only insofar as it gets things done. This is truly treating God as a means to an end. But what Paul says here is that there is power when you center your life on God. But God's way of power is completely different to ours. Paul says it's the power uh, to raise the dead. And the image he uses is Jesus going into the ground like a seed and growing out with new life. This is the image that's always used about God's power, the power of a seed uh, to bring life. And if you think about it, a seed is tiny. It seems to be completely useless in the world. And in fact, the only way that you see the power of a seed grow is to put it into the ground, to make it invisible, to bury it, to make it look even less useful. But then life starts to grow. In our world, there are plenty of bulldozers, plenty of things to to create incredible change. But that change, it may move things around, it may destroy things, it may shift things, but it doesn't bring life. And the power of God may look small in the eyes of the world, It may look weak in the eyes of the world. It may look invisible, not working at all in the eyes of the world, but it is the only thing that's actually bringing life. And so when we center our lives on God, we are putting our trust, not just in that God will satisfy us, that God will bring about His purposes, but that God will bring about His purposes in His way. Trusting that all those things move slowly, although things move imperceptibly sometimes, God's purposes are being worked out, and we trust in that. Centering our lives on God means that we trust that God will do it in His way. That's an important word for some of us, because I think we are often discouraged by what looks like the weakness of the church. But my sense is that as the church becomes weaker in the eyes of the world, it will become more powerful because it learns to trust more and more in the way that God does things. I think we've all been alive long enough to see the ways in which the church has taken up the power of the world rather than the power of God. And the fruit of that power has often been greater damage than good. Can we trust instead that God's way will bring about more life than the way of the world? And then finally, Paul prays that we would see the end of all things, that we would see what God is working towards. He says this, And God has put all things under His, that is Jesus' feet, and made Him the head over all things for the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. We believe when we put our trust in God, when we put God at the center, that God is the ultimate authority and ruler that God is the one to whom all things are due and all things are owed, that Jesus is Lord. God has a vision for this world, a vision for you and I, a vision for the church that we can scarcely conceive of. But we do have a hint. And that hint is what we see in the person of Jesus. That the one who will stand over all things at the end is the one who came as a servant. That the one who will have the final authority in the world is the one who came as a merciful healer. That the one who will wield the most power in the world is the one who knows what it feels like to be powerless. This is such a radical vision of the world and we don't quite know what it will look like, but we do know this, that the future of all things will be Christ-like. It's the final nature of all reality. And I, for one, cannot be more moved by the fact that our hope is that reality, the future, everything we dream of will be shaped by the tender, merciful, healing, sacrificial, servant-hearted power of Jesus. Think about this. God turns the world around. He turns what is evil and makes it good. He turns what is weak and makes it strong. He turns what is nothing and makes it something. We have signs of this all around the world. 
We have a sign when we look at the Red Cross, an organization when people look at a cross now on a, on a red background, they see someone coming to bring relief and hope. Do you see how remarkable that is? Back in Jesus' day, when people saw a cross, they saw nothing but fear and terror and dread. Because the cross in Jesus' day, and even in some parts of the world today, represents the power of the powerful over the weak. But Jesus took that image, took the cross, and turned it into something that promises life. This is a sign, a symbol of what God is doing everywhere in all places and at all times, taking what is weak, people like you and me, and using them to bring about his purposes. Taking the church in the places especially where it is at its weakest and using it to be a sign to point other people to God. Using those who are marginalized and broken in the eyes of the world and using them to bring life and healing. Friends, this is what I long for our church, that we will be centered on God. Because if we're not centered on God, we're centered on something else, and that means it's an idol. And it's beneath you and beneath me and beneath all of us. You see, if you fail an idol, it will not forgive you. And if you achieve what an idol promises, it will not satisfy you. But to put God at the center is the thing that will bring both mercy and joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.